Well last video I started with saying that it was adding a new old computer to the collection time again. Well the times will continue as yet again I will be adding a new old computer to my collection. Interestingly this one comes from the same house as that shown in the previous video. The TRS-80 Color Computer 2. As we saw in that video the seller is adamant about packaging the computers really well and as visible by the timestamp it took me already 6 minutes to peel away the first layer of packaging material. So what is this yellow case? I think that to most retro enthusiasts this will look pretty familiar. A floppy disk and a little booklet. Very nice, it was shipped with a hat vibration protector, that's also nice to have. The keyboard appears to be clipped onto the bottom side of the computer. The cable is hidden under this plastic. So here it is, the Commodore 128D, what a lovely computer. Let's give the keyboard a quick try. Nice keys, great to type on. I also like those keys that lock. Let's see if the computer works. It was sold as in working order. More on testing this computer later. Yep, it powers on. Commodore Basic version 7. Takes the inputs from the keyboard very well. Let's do a quick basic program. Now let's take a look at some badly researched history. The computer of course was released by Commodore as a successor to their very successful Commodore 64. In late 1985 and at the beginning of 1986, Commodore decided they wanted the desktop version of the Commodore 128, similar to the what is now retro unobtainium Amiga 1000. This of course resulted in a 128D, which looks very similar. Now take a look at what is my favorite retro computer commercial. Love the creativity that went into this. Wonder who voiced it. To match the higher intelligence of the new Commodore 128, an Apple IIc would have to add three more IIcs to expand to 512K. An extra keypad, 30 block graphic sets, color sprites, two more voices, four instruments, a cartridge port, a joystick port, and a Commodore 64. Commodore 128 personal computer, a higher intelligence at a lower... This recording ended abruptly, although I think it is quite clear what he would have said next. Mine, like the Coco 2, still has a warranty label, so it's going to stay closed. But this is what the motherboard looks like. This, of course, is the Silox Z80 CPU that was also used in a lot of Sinclair computers, the Amstrad CPC and Philips P2000, among others. Also a MOS 8580, a sort of newer version of the CPU used in the Commodore 64. Very interesting to see two CPUs next to each other. If we take away the RF shield, we'll find the video chips. Here we have a VIC-2 chip labeled as a MOS 8565. On the other side we have a MOS 8563 video display controller. This chip is in the computer to generate 80 column RGB video. What makes the 128 a versatile machine is the fact it runs a lot of operating system, like basic version 7, basic version 2 in Commodore 64 mode and CPM. So I think I have something very interesting to test this machine with. This is a dedicated Commodore 128 program. The title is The Last V8. I think there are no more than 50 titles that are dedicated to the Commodore 128. And I believe a lot of them are text adventures. So really nice to have. I got this with my normal form factor Commodore 128 a while back. I made this YouTube short about picking it up. It needs some retrobrite but works great and came with the 1571 disk drive. It is an auto boot game, so no commands required. The music is really great, although the game is very tough to play. I kept dying. Apparently you need to pick up coins from the map. Driving through that map is quite hard though. Let's move to C64 mode. I have more compatible software for that. I like how it asks if I'm sure. We cannot move back to 128 mode, like this, because changes making sure this would be possible would reduce compatibility with Commodore 64 software. It changes the modes very fast. 
So I got out a box of C64 floppies and a cartridge game, Jupiter Lander. Before we start loading some programs, let's take a quick look around the case. I like the design of this front batch, very much like the Commodore 64C. Something that makes the computer very nice to use is the internal 1571 disk drive. On the side is a keyboard port, two control ports and a drive, and computer reset switch. It appears that the drive reset button has broken off. On the back there are a lot of ports, starting with an expansion port, a cassette port, serial port, video output, channel adjustment, RF out, RGB I out, a user port and the power in. What I really like about this computer is the use of an internal power supply. Let's start with this Ghostbusters disc. It is that it's clear that this is running on a 128, otherwise it would have just looked like the Commodore 64 was connected to the display. I've been loading programs from SD to IEC lately, which uses a browser program, so I forgot the exact commands of loading, which I had to Google. But now I remember, it's comma 8, comma 1. After figuring this out as a retro amateur, the program booted, which made some issues clear with my Commodore 1701. The color sometimes goes off and the sound is wobbly which even made me use an ancient method of fixing stuff. Very nice intro screen though. I like this game, although every time like the most games I have to reference the manual to understand how to play it. I tried fixing some of the issues with my monitor by spraying some of my trusty contact cleaner into the sockets of the controls. I think this will require some disassembly to really give those controls a good clean and make them function again. Something probably for a future video. I also loaded this program, which did a weird garbled display, but had interesting music under it. I had the left and right RCA jacks hooked up directly to my camera and this is what it sounds like. This also means that when I smack the monitor you won't hear it. So I moved the 1701 to the side for now and swapped it out for the Philips television that I used in my previous video. It also had some funky connection problems I will have to sort out. I want to try my SD to IEC with the C128 but it appears that it's not compatible with this computer as the browser program doesn't want to load. Then I plugged in the cartridge game, Jupiter Lander, which I had to clean the cartridge port for a bit to make it work, which is very normal. The game played very well, also again a direct input into my camera. The computer also came with the CPM system disk, which is great, so I connected it to my Philips RGBI monitor. Something that I also did the first time I tried it after getting the Commodore 128D. Then it booted into the 80 column version of basic version 7, so I assumed I could go from there to Commodore 64 mode, but when I typed go 64 the computer froze. Also when I booted or reset the computer while holding the Commodore key down, this happened. At first I feared that the computer had suffered some shipping damage or that the chips weren't making good contact anymore. But luckily connecting it to a composite monitor showed me it still works. Of course you have to press the locking key with 4080 display written on it. The keyboard of the 128 has of course more keys than a C64. It has a numpad, the function keys are in a different place and other orientation. Also it has dedicated control keys and the normal cursor keys for a Commodore computer. One thing I find a bit annoying though is the placement of the restore key over the return key as I keep pressing the wrong key because of this. Booting CPM in 80 column mode goes like this. DIR of course loads a directory. This CPM function we will have to test out later with some CPM software, because now I can only show the whole program on the disk it came with. It is clear that I'm very happy with this Commodore 128D, so much that we can raise the stage and pronounce the C128D as my new favorite retro system. Which means this is surely not the last time you'll have seen it here. But for now, thanks for watching.